Forty years ago, thousands of Oklahomans were glued to their television sets as Neil Armstrong took his first steps on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But there were dozens of Sooners in Houston working on the Apollo 11 mission. From the Mercury missions to the Mars rover, Oklahomans have played critical roles in space exploration. We are the only state that has had an Oklahoma, you know, to have someone from their state involved in every aspect of the space program. Leroy Gordon Cooper was one of seven astronauts involved in Project Mercury. The Shawnee native entered the space program in April of 1959. Cooper served as a capsule communicator for John Glenn's first orbital space flight. Space historian and documentary producer Bill Moore spoke with Cooper back in 2000. He talked a lot about um, those early days of space flight and how good it was because the astronauts were really involved. They, they each got an assignment. They would either work on the space suit, uh, the electronic systems, the environmental systems, whatever it was. Each of them took a specialty. Cooper launched into space on May 15, 1963. He circled the Earth 22 times and logged more hours in space than the previous Mercury astronauts. Gordon Cooper, he was, he was Oklahoma's pioneer. After the Mercury missions, Cooper would take part in Project Gemini. He was a command pilot for Gemini 5. Gemini 5 is significant from the standpoint it was really America's first breakout flight. Uh, up till then, we had just been following the Russians. We'd been on their coattails. They flew for eight days, and that was the longest mission of anyone up till then. That was also long enough to go to the moon, so we knew man could survive in space, because in the early days, they didn't know whether they could stay alive for eight days in space. Another Oklahoman would be on the next Gemini mission into space. In fact, it was, it was a great birthday present. They announced the, um, the nine astronauts uh, on my uh, 32nd birthday. General Thomas Stafford pilot Gemini 6. The Weatherford native would be part of the first rendezvous in space. During the venture, Gemini 6 and Gemini 7 met up in orbit and maneuvered within just a few feet of each other. Gemini was a, uh, was a, a tremendous step towards the moon. Without Gemini, we couldn't have done Apollo. Stafford was in the command chair four years later on Apollo 10, the first flight of the lunar module to the moon. Here in Houston, Apollo 10, you can tell the world that we have arrived. Roger, Dan, it's good to hear well, from I you. I believe this thing. Stafford would scan the surface of the moon and map the terrain. So here we come across the Sea of Tranquility. And right in here was the uh, Apollo 11 landing site. And uh, down here there was, a, to the left, that's what I named the Oklahoma Hills, not in my home state, the Oklahoma Hills, at a Weatherford crater there. Stafford also simulated the landing for the next mission. Now, the actual landing occurs from 50,000 feet above the moon on down. But he went down to 50,000 feet to simulate landing and then came back up. Of course, Ron Dudin came back. Oklahoma City native Jerry Elliott was in mission control during Stafford's historic flight. Elliott was a retro fire officer for the Apollo missions. He was one of the men in charge of bringing the astronauts home. The success of the Apollo 10 that we had to have in order to accomplish Apollo 11. In fact, all of the missions prior to Apollo 11 gave a certain contribution and a certain confidence. It was hard to sleep the night before, just from a personal standpoint. The excitement of all the years of training, of education, of planning. July 17, 1969, Apollo 11 lifted off and three days later Americans reached the moon. At home, Americans were struck with a sense of awe. But there was a different atmosphere in mission control, one filled with tension. 60 seconds. We almost Take ran five. out of fuel on, on the way down. 40 feet down, two and a half, picking up some dust. Great shadow. Four forward, drift into the right a little. 30 seconds. Forward, just we couldn't see it from the ground, obviously, but the, the crew uh, were uh, hovering over a rock field, boulder field, and that's why Armstrong took a little extra time to maneuver away from that. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. 
The Eagle has landed. Apollo 13, probably the most famous flight of the missions other than Apollo 11. Jerry Elliott was the lead retrofire officer for Apollo 13. I think on Apollo 13, it was our common sense that brought us through uh, most of uh, the problems that we encountered. Elliott was on the ground while OU graduate Fred Hayes was on Apollo 13. When he lost the landing, he was very upset about losing the landing. That realization hurt him more than the fact that they were in danger. On April 13, 1970, two days after the crew lifted off, a fault in the electrical system caused an explosion. The blast took out the power and the oxygen tanks in the service module, but the command module air supply remained intact. It tested our, our knowledge, our, our convictions of being able to do what we needed to do. It was the supreme test of competence and patience and endurance uh, in the face of, of uh, hardship. Uh, there was no sense of defeat. The crew of Apollo 13 climbed aboard the lunar module and used it as their lifeboat on the return. We knew that the astronauts were coming home. We didn't know that they'd make it safely down to uh, uh, the landing part because we didn't know that the integrity of the heat shield had been compromised or not. So there were still a lot of unknowns until we saw the chutes open and the call out from the crew. We knew that they were safe and they were here. Elliot's next and final mission was less dramatic and he would once again be working with Tom Stafford. Historians can look back on it now and see that this was the mission that began the thawing of the Cold War. In 1975, Stafford was the commander of the Apollo Soyuz test project. It was a joint space flight which led to the first meeting in space between the American astronauts and Soviet cosmonauts. I think General Stafford is extremely proud of his part in the Apollo Soyuz mission because he sees it as, as, a, as a major turning point in international relations, in um, in our space program and how it's become a cooperative effort now. Shannon Lusa would also spend time with Russian cosmonauts. She talks about how Tom Stafford paved the way for that to happen because he had opened up that, you know, that, that window with the Russians. In 1996, the Bethany Navy spent six months aboard Mir, the Russian space station. Until the International Space Station, Lusa held the record for the longest time in space for a woman. An Oklahoman from Wetumpka helped create the International Space Station. John Harrington traveled to the now famous space station in 2002 aboard Endeavour. When he was applying for the astronaut corps, he said there was a big panel that he had to appear before and they asked him all kinds of questions. And the last one is, why do you think you could be a, astro a good astronaut? And he said, I like to tinker. He said, I like to tinker on cars, I like to work with things. His love of tinkering would come in handy for his mission. During three spacewalks, Harrington installed a trust on the International Space Station. These are just a few of the many Oklahomans who contributed and are contributing to space exploration. Local space historian Bill Moore has been interviewing these pioneers for nine years. He, along with OATA, are working on a five-part series that will air in 2010. We are the only state that has had an Oklahoma, you know, to have someone from their state involved in every aspect of the space program.